when I take it to the bank, I'm going to say they were drinking. That's fine. Okay, you can get the point. What I'm saying is that if we get into a position where there's certain things that we will, will adapt and we'll formulate some sort of a trench, and we become so comfortable with that trench, that behavior, that getting out of it, even if the behavior is not good for us, we feel resistant to it. Okay, now can people learn? Absolutely. People can learn, people can learn. <coughs> if anyone in, in, in the room works in the physiotherapy or speech therapy or occupational health field, you're going to see that all the time where people will relearn. We see that in the sporting line. I do a lot of work with professional athletes where people can learn to do things from both sides. Absolutely, we can do that if in fact we choose to do it. Now, what can we learn from the kids? We have a 20-year-old daughter at home, and you're going to hear a lot about both of those kids this afternoon when I have a chance to be able to come in and have a really fun talk with all of you. And I have a 16-year-old son as well. Now, I want to tell you about Matthew and 16, our 16-year-old son. Does anyone else have someone in the house who does any of the gaming thing? Okay. Now, we will give him a certain amount of time to do it. And Matt and I will get down and we'll play like an MLB baseball game or a driving game or a skiing game or something like that. He'll buy the, the game and he'll go downstairs and the instructions, what happens to the instructions? They're over there, okay? They're on the side and he's just going to go through it, he's going to try it and he'll make a mistake and he'll try it again and he'll make a mistake and he'll get better at it. Now if you know anything about games, and I don't know a lot about them, but you'll reach a certain level and then what happens is you have to go to the next level. Now what Matthew taught me is that once you achieve level one, when you go to level two, you have to forget everything you learned in level one in order to be successful in level two. So you unlearn it, and then you have to relearn something altogether new. So the interesting piece about this is our kids, for the, for the most part, and I'm going to say 25 and below, have a tendency to be able to adapt to change a whole lot more consistently. As a matter of fact, one of the interesting things about what we've learned from Harvard's medical review, and you're going to hear me refer to this at least two or three times today, is that there is a stimulating impact for change, or from change, for the young person. Adrenaline, endorphins, and opiates, and actually will move through our system as they encounter change in that challenge. So that's an interesting change personality. And we'll look at this one. If we were as critical of our own children when it comes to change, as we are of ourselves, you know, how healthy would it be? Now, I'm extremely challenging of myself when it comes to, a ch to change, but with Matt and Jill, I'm probably very open and very encouraging. But for us, every now and then, we need to stop and we have to allow ourselves to kind of go through that change so that we can be successful. It's almost like we become our own cheerleaders. So that begins to set the stage a little bit. Does anyone know who Thomas J. Watson is? Now, for those of you on computers, you probably know, okay, IBM. Now, the interesting thing is he references, and this is the same guy, by the way, who was quoted as saying when, um, when referencing Bill Gates, that there would only really be a need for about four personal computers in the world. Pretty good uh, suggestion, wouldn't you say that? Wouldn't you say? He was wrong. However, he did say this, and this is fascinating, that we need to be able to double our rate of failure for the most part before we achieve success. Now, has anyone ever done that before in that you, would, you introduce something new to yourself and into, into your life and you know in order for you to succeed you have to fail at least a couple of times. And in order for us to be able to succeed more, we have to fail more. And it almost seems counterproductive because we've been teaching ourselves that we have to be successful all the time. Again, you can take a look at any sport in the world, and people, the more they fail, the better they get, because it's continuous and continuous practice. So it's the same sort of thing we have to allow ourselves to do. It. Now, when we take a look at change and our comfort with change, there are three different categories we're going to take a look at. One of those, well, let me whip through this with you really quickly. First one, we'll go back a bit, three different categories, the first one will be in control. Let's take a look at the types of change and, and control. One, we have no control and no time to adapt. Two, no control and lots of time to adapt. C, control, no time to adapt. And D, control and lots of time to adapt. Everyone got it? Perfect. It's going to be tested in a second. I looked at that and I thought, there's not a chance I'm going to get that into my head. 
So, typical, I like pictures. So let's take a look at the pictures here. No time, no control. And these are tough things. And this is the most difficult type of change to adapt to. It might be a car accident. It could be the sudden loss of a loved one. Someone comes to your door, and unfortunately, this is really trauma talking to you. <clears throat> if someone comes to your door, and they give you that news. It's instantaneous. You have no control over the results. And you have absolutely no time to adapt. And that's a very difficult one because, in fact, we, first of all, we want to be able to have control. We need time to be able to percolate and come up with some sort of a plan for ourselves. We do that quite naturally. So that's number one. Next is that we have no control, but we do have some time to adapt. So it could be something like a, you know, a surprise um, positive test. It could also be um, a variety of things where people have no control whatsoever initially, but they realize that they've got a ton of time to adapt, and it could be, you know, a move. That's another thing, a move. They have to move, but they're not going to be moving for at least six months, so they can do that. Next thing is control and no time. What happens is your boss comes in and says, we're closing up shop. However, if you want to be able to move to our new area, you can do that. The challenge is, and it's your choice, the challenge is that you need to decide by 8 in the morning. So you do have control over the choice, but you need to be able to decide now. And I remember being in that exact position. Janet and I were just married, probably two years. We hadn't had children yet. We had our first dog. My boss said, we need you to move to Halifax. Now, we had just settled in from Montreal to the Toronto area. And I looked at her, she had had a great job, and, and I said, what do you think? And we brought in a realtor, put a sign on, the, on the, uh, the lawn, came home the next day, she looked at me, I looked at her, he said, can't do it. But the boss had wanted a decision, so I had to go back to the boss, grovel a bit, and say, sorry, I can't do this thing. So, lots of control over the decision, but no time, and the final one, is we have both time and control. These are the best possible changes we can encounter. Well, you might plan that proposal, and you might plan that wedding. We've got lots of time and lots of control. And I kind of smirk inside because when I think about weddings, in fact, most people who are going through the planning will say, no, I don't have much control. Not at all. <laughs> but in principle, everyone understands that. So those four different types of change are key. But then we, what we do is we take that and we impose our personality or our personality becomes imposed upon that. And there are different kinds of people who have different visions of or approaches to change. Let me introduce those two as well, if I picture. The visionary, craves change, highly creative, and leaps before looking. Now, how many people were aware that the new iPhone came up last week? Or, I'm glued, okay. Anyone get one? Anyone get one of those brand new, uh, you did? Did you line up? Did you? How, how long was the lineup? I lied. My husband lined up for Say it again? My husband lined up for me. That is something we've got to talk about. I want to be able to figure out how to get someone to do that. <laughs> so, my daughter decided she was going to get one of these new iPhones. And we happened to walk through our local mall in New Market, Ontario, and we were going to buy it through our Rogers store. Now, as you walk around the corner to go to the Rogers store, before you get there, the Apple store is there. And I swear there are 400 people who had been camped out there, first one at 9.30 the night before, store opens at 8 o'clock in the morning. Those would be the people who say, I want that first and foremost. Now, if we don't have those, products don't sell. If we don't have those people who absolutely embrace change, no, are addicted to change, you could almost say that with a small a, don't quote me on that, but they definitely need it in their bloodstream. If those 400 people don't line up, we have a challenge, because no one will try it. Remember a commercial years ago, you know, it was Life Brand Cereal, the two boys sitting there, and then there was Mikey, and they said, give it to Mikey, because Mikey will always try that stuff. We need Mikey's. Next thing, we don't have the change agents. So these make for the lion's share of the people who are the impetus behind change. 
they would be the people, for the most part, who fund shame. They would be the ones where someone like Mike might come and say, tell me, or with Steve, would come to me and say, I've got a great idea. Fantastic. Here's how it's going to work. Boom, boom, boom. Um, but I need to be able to have some sort of support behind it. So it might be a guy like me who says, all right, I can see this and I can see that. Here's a marketing plan. Here's how we're going to sell it. And here's how we're going to fund it. There's a very good friend of mine back in Ontario. He works with his three brothers. He owns businesses across the country. And he is definitely the first one. He's the visionary. He comes in, and I was saying to my brother a couple, a couple days ago, a couple weeks ago, this is what he did. He went into Orangeville, Ontario, bought himself a brand new building, came into my office, he said, I am so cranked, I just bought a building. I said, that's fantastic, great. He said, 1.5 million bucks, I said, nothing. wow, okay, great. And then I asked the question that this guy would ask, and that is, well, what are you gonna do with it? He said, I don't know yet, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> really? But my brothers will figure that, because that's what they do, okay? So they would be the change adapters. Okay, now, majority adapters, interesting because this is the largest part of the population. Those are the people who, after everyone else has done it, they will do it. That would be me when it comes to technology. But those are the people who, oh, let's go back to my father-in-law, fascinating man. Last week he was up and he said, uh, Julie, you getting one of those new phones? Yeah, come on, Grant, let's go to the Apple store and take a look at it. Lo and behold, he's pulling out one of these iPads. He's talking to the guy, getting all kinds of information. He's 87 years of age. He's thinking this is absolutely the greatest investment. When you're 87 years of age, everything's an investment. I mean, you've got to really think about that. But he says, no, this is, this is change. I want to embrace change. That's really quite significant. I'm going to reference him again in a second. But these people, they will change because that's the way the current is moving. And then the, finally, the resistors. And the resistors are those people who say absolutely no. I don't care. They still have a dial-up phone. <laughs> All right, so let me juxtapose two people. Talk about my father-in-law. His name happens to be Bill also. This is something I, my wife had no imagination at all. <laughs> so he uh, loves change. He goes to Montreal to visit with his brother, younger brother, in fact, and his wife. And they're lovely people, but they would be resistors to everything. And they're sitting there talking about their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. My father-in-law, Bill, said, you know what you got to do? you got to get on Skype. You're going to love it. You know, the kids in Ontario, they're going to be able to see you. And they said, what's Skype? Well, Skype is this new program on a computer. Computer. We don't do it. <coughs> Pardon me. We don't do computers. What do you don't do? No, we don't do computers in this house. Really? So this is not 30 years ago. This is three months ago. They're absolutely adamant that they're not going to do it. And that's okay, but in fact, some of the things that other people were doing and changing and adapting to, they were unable to do, given what? Given their personality. So we take that, and we have to also appreciate one more thing, that different times require different personalities and different changes. I showed you a slideshow for a purpose. Think about what I do for a living. Someone picks up the phone, they call me, and they say, Bill, we just had a plane go down, in such and such a place. So we've had a terrorist act in Islamabad in a hotel. We need you and your team to go. Great, great, no problem. Everything's calm, not a challenge at all. So I get the team together, I go. I kind of relish that change. It gets me excited to go. So I've got change all the time. New clients coming in to see me all the time. Then I go home, and I've got the most patient wife in the world who kind of spins her head at me every now and then and says, what is the deal here? Because she, I walk in and she says, Bill, I've just changed the couch from here to here. I don't know, you can't do that. Oh, that's just uncomfortable for me. That couch has been there for 30 years, Janet. I don't like change, you know that. She said, do you even remember what you do for a living, buddy? So different, now I'm not saying that that's a good thing, by the way, but I'm saying that we, in fact, shift and change our change personality and we don't even know it sometimes. Okay, so. Let's talk about those things in terms of our ability to cope with what is it influenced by. 